You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones and the Temple Film. I'm Steve. No, I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the box art trailers behind the scenes. And this is the film that helped us name our podcast. It's episode 200. Matt, can you believe we made it this far? I'm trying to think like 200. Then we do like, you know, one a week. So what have we been doing this for like four years then now? I think 2017, yeah, October 2017 was our start. Fuck, four years, holy shit. I thought we just started this thing, and now we're into number 200. (laughs) Well, to celebrate, let's pour some scotch. Does that sound delicious next to the microphone? Or you're peeing, one of the two. (laughs) (laughs) Nope, nope, I'm not the kind of guy who pees in a bottle during the podcast, but I've heard about them. (laughs) <laughs> which uh, i mean kudos to anyone who can do that and in episode 200 we finally got to peeing in a bottle while podcasting we finally hit that mark matt it's magic I, it's it's another celebration <laughs> fuck the 200 we made it to pee in a bottle level oh uh, we've we've had a lot of good episodes we've talked about a lot of good movies we've talked about a couple movies that can you know burn in hell but i'm looking at you valkyrie or whatever that was thousand planets Ugh. Still my bad, everyone. But, you know, we get to this. You know, I'm not saying that the next, uh, you know, Indiana Jones that we do isn't as good. Yes, I am. Um, I'm just saying this is this is the top. So, Matt, introduce. What do we watch this week? We are watching 1984's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Woo! Let's rock that trailer. The old legend of the Shankara stones. The villagers' sacred rock was taken. Village stories, Dr. Jones. Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. Archaeologists were always funny little men searching for their mummies. Mummies. They even got a little bitty mummy quib in there. Ha <laughs> ha! He does it all. Treasure, mummies, adventure, Nazis, all of it. <laughs> He's Dr. Jones. I mean, he rescued a little Chinese kid when he was four years old living on the street. Exact Short round. That's right. You know, a lot of people, I think, forget that this is a prequel. I think so, too. I mean, often what is talked about, if you're talking about Indiana Jones, you're usually talking about Raiders of the Lost Ark. So, you know, I don't think this one is like the go to, I guess, Indiana Jones movie. You know, like I said, I think it's Raiders. But with that, I think, yeah, people just sort of have the knowledge of that one. And they're like, well, this is the next one. So obviously it would be, you know, in the 40s or whatever. But yeah, it's in the 30s. So it, it is a prequel in a, in a day and age when we didn't see a lot of prequels. But in terms of what they're going for in the series, where it's supposed to be kind of like a serial, it totally makes sense that with the next one, we would just kind of jump back in time and just see another adventure. Yeah, I always wondered if they're like, well, he was already so fantastic in the first one. If we do the next one, you know, he's already hit his, his top. You know, Indy is Indy at that point. So let's go back in the in the past when he's a little sloppier, he's a little 
you know, rough around the edges compared to what he was. And I think they pulled that off in this, but I think the problem is a lot of people think it's a step down in his character, but really it's a prequel, but they don't sell it well. I don't see it in the trailers. I hardly ever see it marketed. You know what I mean? It just seems like they put out a film and they're like, yeah, it's a prequel. You didn't really tell everyone that. Nowadays, they market the hell out of that. Right. Like this movie, it starts off and it says like 1930, whatever year that's set in. And if you don't remember that the first one is set in like 40, whatever, you wouldn't even know. Because, yeah, like you said, it doesn't really say anything besides that. Yeah. And Spielberg and Lucas were on the same page that they were not going to do a Nazi villain again. Which is funny because they come back in the third one with Nazi villains. But there's a reason for that. Uh, the third one is always going back to the first. There's a lot of things with that one. But this one, they decided, OK, let's what is interesting. And Lucas, I or actually, I think Spielberg wanted the uh, bad guys to be in India. I think he was really interested in filming in India, which is funny because of the content. They weren't allowed to film in India. <laughs> I think they had to film in a. I don't actually know which country, but it was not actually India. But they did get a lot of Indian actors, which is funny. For adventure movies kind of sake, I guess India would be like sort of considered an exotic land for a character like this to go visit. So it makes sense. Yeah, I really wish I'd remember the country. Uh, Bangladesh kind of comes to mind. But I don't think that's correct. I just think I'm uh, spewing nonsense. Yeah, I don't I do not know where it filmed. Yeah, I mean, filmed all over because they also did some sets in L.A., which, by the way, that whole Kalima scene where they're doing the chanting and ripping the hearts out. Can you believe that's a set? I mean, I can believe it's a set because it's Spielberg. <laughs> like, is it, that's... But it's so good. It look, oh, yeah, it looks amazing. Like I, that, The fact that I believe it doesn't mean that uh, it's not good. It's just, you know, in, in the very capable hands of Steven Spielberg, like, yeah, he'll make a set like that look good. And it looks incredible. It reminds me of sort of like the 30s, big budget kind of early Hollywood adventure movies and serials, which is exactly what this is a send up to. So it like it kind of works. Yeah. And I think that's why they had the huge number at the beginning, the dance number and everything like that. Is that considered golden? What years are considered golden Hollywood? I think it's just like those pre World War Two post sound years pretty much okay and i actually might be uh, right i just looked up uh, bangladesh and i think it actually was bangladesh that they ended up recording a lot of it before they went over to studios to do a lot of the reshoots and to like set up the sets so sometimes steve's brain gets something right yeah it happens the blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while there you go <laughs> uh so let's go on to our history of this Matt, do you remember the first time you watched this? I do. I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandpa had the trilogy VHS box set. And I just, on a whim, was looking at his movies and picked this one out. So I don't even think I had seen the other two yet, because um, there were only the three out at the time. And I just put it on, and by literally by the time we got to like the Kali Ma scene, I was like, whoa this is like everything I like like <laughs> that I would rent on my own or whatever, but it's so cool that they have this. And then, yeah, I sort of immediately fell in love with this movie and have seen it about 500 more times since. Yeah. I saw this the magical year of 1990 when Steve became eight years old and he thought he was a big boy. I mean, in some people's eyes I was, and I saw gremlins and Gremlins was my gateway to everything uh, because it basically became like, well, I saw Gremlins so I can see Raiders. of the, You know, I can see Temple of Doom. I saw Temple of Doom so I can see, you know, Predator. I saw and this like became the stacking of movies when I would get away with this stuff with my parents or my aunts and uncles and everything like that. And this I think Gremlins and Temple of Doom were the films in 1990 that I got to see and then just started stacking movies. And that's how I started watching all these. And then, of course, my brothers, which were just a, you know, a little over a year younger than me, they tagged right along. My twin brothers who are younger. So uh, I loved it. 1990. What a great year for me. 
the year that you know us kind of nerds fall in love with movies is special so (laughs) hang on to that gremlins and this which basically created pg-13 because parents were so pissed yeah i remember i remember reading about all that and yeah how like they weren't graphic or whatever necessarily but just yeah that parents were having kids that were having nightmares and stuff because of the stuff they saw in these two movies and i remember reading about how kind of quickly after this the mpaa had been like all right we're gonna do a pg-13 yeah, I guess both of them work together pretty well on this because the studios were like, uh, we're losing money. And the NPA was like, well, everyone's pissed at us, too. So let's uh, let's actually work together proper. And then they got a PG-13. And I don't know who wrote the rules for those, but I can tell you when, you know, you were a kid in the late 80s and early 90s, you could every once in a while get a fuck and a boob. Yep. And you're like, oh, my God, this is the greatest. <laughs> and your parents couldn't say anything to you. You're following the rules. It's a PG movie or a PG-13 movie, whatever, you know, whatever. Every Halloween, you know, I always watch Beetlejuice and it just like cracks me up how that's PG and it has a fuck in it. Like, yeah. <laughs> can't even say it on TV still yet in 2021, but like PG movies, you could get away with one back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I remember when Cable started allowing like one bitch and everyone's like, oh, society's falling apart. And then, of course, we had nipples and friends, and then it was it was over. We haven't been the same since. Yeah, the, the downfall of modern society was Rachel's nipples. Yep, there you go. It wasn't 9-11 <laughs> that changed us. It was Rachel's nipples. It's fact now. It's been said on Analog Jones. Now it's on the internet. Boom. Done. This is where Matt has to guess the box office totals. Now, Matt, which one do you want? You want domestic or worldwide? I'm a I'm a domestic guy. I usually always look at the domestic box offices. So let's see if I can guess this. So you chose domestic. Here are the movies that were coming out at the same time. Breakin'. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's one, you know, that I mean, of course, everyone remembers Breakin' 2, Electric Boogaloo. But I mean, the, the first Breakin' was like really successful and good. I've never seen it. I love dance no. movies, though, so I need to get on that. I'm surprised you haven't seen that. Yeah, you you do like musicals and dance films. Yeah, and I, I for whatever reason, have not seen Break. I do think randomly, though, I have seen Break Into Electric Boogaloo, though. Oh, that, that's the one that where they like, they wrote it, shot it, edited it, put it out in like eight months after the first one. Total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> As it usually is when those things happen. <laughs> Good job, Cannon. Uh, and then number three, we had or number two, The Natural. You've seen that, right? Never seen it. Oh, baseball movie. That's like that's the baseball movie that a lot of baseball people put up there, along with, uh, you know, Field of Dreams. I'm more of a Sandlot guy because, you know, I grew up in 80s, 90s. Love those kid films. But we also had Romancing the Stone. OK. Police Academy. OK. 16 Candles. Firestarter. Splash. And the last one, Footloose. 84, big year for movies that would either go on to become classics or spawn franchises. So Yeah, what's funny is way down there is Friday the 13th, the final chapter. But it came out in April, so, you know, it was at uh, its last legs. Yeah, those movies are always so front-loaded for audiences. So Pretty funny that you would put a Friday the 13th out in April. Doesn't seem very smart. I would have that in October every time. <laughs> yeah, I- Got to have it in the fall at least. But anyway, those were the movies. What is your guess for the domestic total? Uh, I'm going to go. I, I feel like I'm playing it a little safe, but I think I want to go. The budget was $28 million. I'm going to go a little bit conservatively on this, but still high considering it's an Indiana Jones movie. And I'm going to say domestic... 95 million okay yeah you went a little little conservative uh so in the it uh max theaters it was up to 1600 almost 1700 the opening weekend was 25.3 million and total domestic ended up being 179.8 million dollars oh wow i just didn't think in the in that time period that so many movies broke 100 million but i guess i'm wrong i guess i i guess that is the case well it didn't do as well as uh raiders of the lost ark in domestic 
but it came out in more theaters. How about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I think just like the eighties and, you know, franchises and stuff starting to take off and yeah, the multi release, the blockbuster was very much already an established thing now in 84. So I guess that makes sense. It'd be in more theaters, but, uh, yeah, I just I don't know why I never want to shoot over a hundred million for something this old. Uh, but one hundred and seventy million is nothing to be bad about, and that's probably why we got two more sequels. <laughs> now it was a huge hit, and this is with all the backlash after the first weekend it came out. So people kept coming. Uh, now for fun, for shits and giggles, you want to guess the world worldwide box office? Just just throw it out there. Then I would say 270. Not bad. 333. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it was pretty popular then elsewhere as well as here then, if that's the case. Yeah, and uh, apparently India refused to let it play in their country, but it did allow it to come out on video, which was very successful. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure it was a major success on video because it's a Spielberg movie. (laughs) Now, what's interesting is... I don't have an original release of this. I have the re-release, but the re-release that came as a single. So not a part of the box set. No. So there was the original ones that came out, uh, which I do have, honestly. It's just it's up on my shelves and I'm not getting that one. Uh, And that VHS sucks, by the way. It's dark as hell. I I never watched that. I always watch the re-release here on VHS because they cleaned it up a bit. And this came out. Uh, somewhere in the mid nineties. I I so I've seen the original, which yeah I agree looks like shit, sounds like shit. Um, and then I've seen the box set that probably came out in the nineties, the three. I'll, I'll describe it. It's got the great poster, which this is one of my favorite posters. It is in my hallway. Uh, Sarah was down for this because she's painted. She's like anything painted could go in the hallway because I have ones that you could replace them. So this is one that I hang very proudly. I love it. You know, you've got your your main bad guy there in the background. Malo Ram. Is that how you pronounce? It's Malo Ram, right? I think so. Yeah. The guy chanting Kalima. Yeah. Uh, he is awesome. He's got his big headgear on with the... I actually don't know what type of animal it is, but something with horns. Uh, looks very much like ox or bull, something like that. It's great. It it doesn't matter. It just looks awesome. And then you've got the most handsome man in the world in the 80s, Harrison Ford with his hat on. Uh, And then we got short round there by all the elephants and everything. And then we have probably the most like or hate woman in this movie, maybe an indie of the Indiana Jones movies. We have Kate Capshaw, who is playing Willie Scott. And it's going to be really interesting to hear our two opinions on her. Uh, so let's save it for a bit. But she is very love or hate, honestly, from what I've read. All right. So we got the awesome Indiana Jones font in the Temple of Doom. Then we flip it over to the back. And again, we got the awesome font and everything like that. And then we've got a shirtless Harrison Ford. Ooh, that is man candy right there. Am I right? Looking young. Yeah, he is. He is thin and ready to go. Well, he's he's like, what what would you say in like 84, like 40 something, you know, I, he's, that's a good quote. I don't know. He's, he's an experienced, good looking man. This is no boy we're talking about here. <laughs> I know. How is he like so boyishly handsome and ruggedly mannish at the same time? Well, I wonder if it is just because his career took off when he was so much older. Uh, and it worked in his favor, man. Like He's just a manly man. Willie has no choice but to love him. It's not her yeah. fault. He's just that damn handsome. He's got that drip. Yeah, he's magnetic. So we've got the description here. Indiana Jones, the daredevil archaeologist who saved mankind in Raiders of the Lost Ark, is back in one of the biggest box office smashes in history. This time, Indy's out to find the famous... Arkara Stone, and to save hundreds of children who've been enslaved by a mysterious cult in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It's an action-packed masterpiece of special effects and edge-of-your-seat adventure. Harrison Ford leads an incredible cast in this breathtaking epic shot on three continents by the film's creators, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. 
And what's funny here, this doesn't make any sense. Oh, Canadian home video PG rating. So I have a Canadian release. You know, those slip in. <laughs> they slip they slipped into Suncoasts and FYEs and Walgreens and wherever you bought your VHS tapes back in the day. They those Canadian ones always slip in. It still happens with DVDs, too. That's hilarious. And they very proudly uh, show the little Canadian maple leaf. I love it. Canada, always a big fan of your releases. This version looks better than the OG U.S. release, so <laughs> good on them for that. There are times when they're doing the whole like Kali Ma, you know, like chant and ripping out the hearts and everything in the original release. It's so dark that you just see see like fire and like flashes of people's face in the light. It's bad. Yeah, not one of my favorite VHSs. Um, I I agree 100% that original release because I had it for years. And I think I recently just got rid of it because I was like, I'm never going to watch this one yeah, again. <laughs> you know, like, it was so bad. I may still have it. I got to I got to check the closet, but it, it I, it's not my favorite way to watch this movie. Folks, I've been to Matt's place. He's just got VHS stacked in the hallway, which I'm sure Ashley just loves. Well, it was for the shelves that are coming in, and I've gotten since more shelves, and now they are all in the room. But I oh, still okay. need some more. I still need some more shelves for these VHS fuckers. I got too many of them, and I might be moving in two months, so that'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, have fun with that. I'm sure the I'm sure moving everyone's back who are, is moving all those is uh, very happy for you to be doing that. Yeah, I'm very happy that there are services that do that because <laughs> I will not be. <laughs> yeah, movers are investments in your health. <laughs> yes, yes. Having only done it one time, the last time, uh, I can tell you, lifesavers. <laughs> All right, before we pop this tape in and talk about it, we want to remind you to go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review us. Give us five stars. We really appreciate it. It helps the channel a lot. I know some of you don't like to put descriptions, but that's okay. Matt, what description should they put? Tell me your favorite lunch meat. <laughs> just tell me your favorite lunch meat. Okay, just five stars. Ham. Done. Done. Analog Jones, honey ham. Boom. Done. Done. Now, do they have to put a brand like Boar's Head or anything? They can. It's not required. You could just say ham. You could say crock is ham if that's your favorite. I don't care. But tell me your favorite lunch meat. I only put bacon on sandwiches. I have bacon sandwiches. That is a correct answer as well. As long <laughs> as it has a five star with it. All right. Let's get on to our film here. Now available on video and DVD. Did you get any trailers with yours? No. I got the, you know, generic. By all three, Indiana Jones go on the adventure, blah, blah, blah. Was it the 90s commercial? Yeah, like, it was the 90s when he's like got the whip and they're showing all the popular scenes. Now on video, if it's excitement you want, thrills you seek, action you crave, then remember, adventure does have a name. Indiana Jones. Let her go. And now you can see him like you never have before. You call this archaeology? Digitally remastered by THX. And for the first time, available in both standard and widescreen editions. And I noticed when I watched it this time, there's not one short round line. And I'm like, uh-oh, someone is embarrassed. Yeah, um, I, I can't wait to get into the uh, short round and uh, Willie kind of debates here. Um, I don't think I have any hot takes on it, but uh, I'm interested in getting into that. So I'm going to not say anything yet. <laughs> yeah, in 2021, we can't have hot takes. I mean, everything's been taken. Oh, I'll give you some hot takes. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but, but, not, but you know what? This movie's not going to have any of those. <laughs> this should be interesting. So let's get on to the feature presentation. And now, our feature presentation. Everyone's seen it. Everyone knows about it. We can't really tell you much. We're not going to go scene by scene, but I think it would be fun. Let's just talk about the opening scene. Are you a big fan or are you one of the fans that kind of wanted the old, you know, jungle adventure like the first one gave us? 
No, I'm I'm very much in the camp where it's uh, like I said at the beginning. Like I think that this perfectly is doing like a '30s thing. You have said it in 1935, or I think, or something like that. Um, and you know, it would start with this big production. It feels like a Gold Diggers of 1933 kind of a big musical production. And then you get the dance number and then you get kind of the goofy, like the thing is being kicked away as he's trying to get it or whatever. It feels like a Hollywood thirties movie. So I, I think it works for this movie. They did such a good job with Raiders of making it sort of that post world war II, uh serial adventure. This one nails the thirties, big Hollywood feel. I did like this a lot. It was very much James Bond. That's clear. Uh, and then the big piece, you know, where they're celebrating old Hollywood and everything like that. All it needed was like synchronized swimming in a swimming pool and it would have been full complete. But that's a little ridiculous. Uh, it was supposed to actually be bigger. But the actress, the main actress, uh, her dress was so tight she couldn't move. It was a very expensive dress that they rented and they decided to just cut it, even though she had practiced for over a month to nail it. All the choreograph and everything. Oh, well, dress is too tight. Can't do it. Don't have time. Goes to show you, even if you're Steven Spielberg, you still don't have enough time to get a movie made. So it's just, it's always chasing the clock. Yeah. And this is the lady that he ended up marrying. So uh, he was apparently in love with her uh, uh, from first sight. So much so that uh, he entered his first marriage. Yikes. <laughs> Yee. Which uh, is kind of interesting because George Lucas wrote this while going through a divorce. And then later on, Spielberg was in a dark place because he was about to divorce his wife. I think it was it was either the maybe the falling year. Yeah, it's uh, it is kind of interesting. But yeah, I mean, these are these guys hitting middle age, right? So yeah. stuff like this is going to happen. Yeah. And they're making a ton of money They you know, they're not around. Yep. That too. There's a lot of things. But I, I love the beginning scene of this. Uh, I love the lazy Susan like thing where they're tossing around the diamond and all the shooting that goes on. And it is James Bond. I, I do understand how people are like, this is more James Bond than Indiana Jones. But again, this is a prequel. This is him turning into the Indiana Jones of the Lost Ark. So this is a different guy. He's a little sloppier. Well, it's younger. It's faster. It's looser. I, I think it's accurate. I feel like it's accurate to this, you know, world in this story. So I like it. Yeah. Did you notice the palette change in this from the first like little opening to the airplane? But when they hit India, there's a palette change and it's pretty dramatic. Yeah, I think there's even a palette change from the opening scene to the plane ride as well. Like. I, I think it almost does shift from maybe more old school Hollywood to, I feel like a more kind of like Indiana Jones kind of palette, you know, like I feel like it, it once, once we land there, we begin sort of the, the main movie's adventure. I think it re that's when it really looks like an Indiana Jones movie. And I think that's with some, you know, foresight because obviously I've seen the other two. So I kind of know what they look like, but like, so maybe at the time it might have been a little more jarring, but for me as a modern viewer or whatever, I think it just it looks like a like a Indiana Jones adventure. Yeah, and then I think it just turns straight up into a horror movie at one point, and then it goes back to an Indiana Jones adventure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's crazy the look of this film, how it changes. And I mean, you gotta give props to all the production, all the people behind the camera, all the people doing the the sets and the costumes. This movie looks like a hundred million dollar film. Uh, I mean, that's why it won, you know, two Oscars. I mean, one of them was John Williams. So that's kind of cheating because he is the ultimate cheat code. Well, he didn't win. They, he didn't win. That was nomination. Oh, but they, I thought he won that year, too. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was a nomination, but they did win special effect. OK, yeah. Well, no, I, I got 84. It was nominated. You're right. Nominated for Academy Award for Best Original Score. I thought he won. Oh. But like like you said, it's still a cheat code to get nominated regardless. Yeah. Guy's amazing. Um, he probably didn't win because they're like, oh, you already had a great score to work with that you created. 
<laughs> well, I think that is a little bit disqualifying. Yeah, how could you have yeah. it as best original score for a sequel? You know? <laughs> it's a good point. But, I mean, I gotta admit, the whole Kalima, like, chanting and everything that they do, it's so epic. Uh, I'll play a little bit of it later, but I just love it. But let's get into Short Round and Willie. Okay, so here's a scene that I pulled, and I think kind of, like, encapsulates the stereotypical little... Chinese sidekick that they create and how annoying Willie can be. All in one clip. I did this for you folks. Where did you find your uh, little bodyguard? I didn't find him. I caught him. What? Shorty's family were killed when the Japanese bombed Shanghai. He's been living on the street since he was four. <laughs> I caught him trying to pick my pocket. Didn't I, short stuff? <laughs> the biggest trouble with her is the noise. My friend John and I, who's been on this show many times, used to do this scene all the time. I'm like, I'm little, you cheap big, Doctor Jones. Uh, we did it all the time, and I did the most stereotypical little sidekick guy. I, I never thought anything of it, but uh, I, I can't tell you I don't do that much anymore. Even though I just did it on a podcast right here. <laughs> <laughs> Different time. <laughs> well, when we were in college, we, like I don't know, we're just dumb. We're just like firing off. Yeah, exactly. And I certainly didn't mean anything mean by it. It's just like, I thought the scene was great because I love, I love Short Round. I love Shorty. Yeah, this is a good, good demonstration of sort of the chaos of this movie as well. I mean, this is just like million miles an hour that this thing is going. Okay, as a kid, I never picked up that Willie was screaming all the time and being pretty much useless for the most part. But as an adult, and especially this time watching it, looking for things to talk about. She screams way too much. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. So like when I, when I was growing up and like when I would talk about this with friends or even honestly in like the very early days of like movie message boards, like all the, from, from youth to kind of that, it had always sort of been talked about, at least in my circles, that short round was the annoying one in this movie. I don't think, uh willie was viewed very favorably but i think the person that they always kind of talked about is like wish they didn't add it to the series was the thinking that they were annoying was short run which i never thought i like short run i think short run's funny i like him as part of the movie i like the character and i agree with you now i hear more that willie is annoying and i definitely do agree with that i think that the character is kind of annoying and kind of useless and sort of is just the the maiden who needs saving and yeah maybe that's tied to the 30s-ness of the movie but dial dial it back a little bit i feel like the 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 annoying meter is up pretty high on her but i like short round though so I, i just i had seen the flip over the last 10 years i feel like from hating on short rounds to hating on willie and i i kind of agree more with the hating on willie yeah, because it's weird because Short Round, that actor, Ki Hong Quinn, he was a hero in our house. I mean, he was in Goonies and Temple of Doom. Those movies played all the time in my house. He was awesome. We loved Data. We loved Short Round. The man could have, I mean, if he came over to our house, we'd be like, whatever you want, Short Round. I mean, <laughs> you want Doritos for dinner? Parents, get Data to Doritos. I mean, you know, he would have been a hero. Uh, we yeah, he's a legend him. of like Corey Feldman like status, you know, of these 80s kids movies, right? Like, yeah, he's, a, he's such a part of the blood of two of like the big Spielberg, you know, movies that all of us kind of nerds grew up with. So, yeah, I think so, too. I think he is legend status. Yeah, he was funny. He was smart. He had cool gadgets. He helped Indiana Jones. He went on an adventure with Indiana Jones. Nothing is cooler than that. <laughs> like if sure. you were like if i was eight years old when i saw this nothing was cooler than hanging out with indiana jones and driving a car 
during a getaway and then like beating up bad guys at the end. I, I mean, there's nothing cooler. There's no movie that's cooler for an eight year old to pretend like they're in the film. Uh, I, that's the thing. I think like, you know, when I hear, when I would hear like people that didn't like short round and stuff, I think people like you and me like this character because we are so in touch kind of with our inner child, you know, with nostalgia and things like that. And, and like, yeah, he, when you're watching this movie as a kid, he is the kid perspective of going on the adventure with Indiana Jones. How cool is that? You know, like, and I think because we're still in touch with that, we still like that character. But I think for some other people that maybe saw this as an adult or something like that, sure, they may think he's a little annoying. But for us, not not at all. He's us for the movie. Yeah, and the thing is, is like when I look at stuff as an adult now, child actors or child characters are annoying because one, they're bad at, at acting. Or two, they're useless characters that are just stuck in there to get kids to like. I think short round... While some people might not like that he's, you know, the most stereotypical Chinese sidekick. Uh, I mean, I think he even does Kung Fu at one point in this. Doesn't he? Pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, that's it. 1984. I'm not giving it an excuse, but. It's, no, I, it's I know. It's 84. Anymore. I get it. But it's just like, you know, it fits all those stereotypes and everything. But he was useful. He was a good sidekick. He did his job. And he's a good actor. Yeah. So that's that's the thing is like he was actually a strong stereotypical <laughs> sidekick, uh, even though, yes, I get it. Uh, the broken English and all the jokes, you know, being the ah, we get it, folks, it's 1984. I don't think these people were ever doing anything mean. I just think they're just two dudes from California being white and not knowing any better. Yep, just yeah, just not knowing that like, oh yeah, this may be hurting some people's feelings. Uh don't do that. But <laughs> they didn't know that at this time. They didn't know any better. And this is the same you you said sixteen candles. This is the same year as Long Duck Dong, you know? So mm -hmm. <laughs> we just were and that's a beloved movie as well. So it's just uh unfortunate of the time. I don't really have much to say about it. It's just what it is. I you know, turn her annoyance down. And maybe don't do so much stereotypical things, but I don't think they meant anything bad by it. So at the same time, it's still a legendary role, and I'm sure he still makes a ton of money doing signatures at con. So I'm sure he's fine. Yeah, who's laughing now? <laughs> All right. So the other controversial scene, you know, the whole dinner scene, uh, which I have a little bit of it right here, about maybe 30, 40 seconds. Captain Blumbert was just telling me something of the interesting history of the palace, the importance it played in the mutiny. It seems the British never forget the mutiny of 1857. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I think there are other events before the mutiny, going back a century, back to the time of Clive, that are more interesting. And what events are those, Dr. Jones? Well, if memory serves me correctly, this area, this province, was the center of activity for the Fuggy. Oh! Sneak? Surprise! What's the surprise? <laughs> Dr. Jones, you know perfectly well that Huggy Cult has been dead for nearly a century. Yes, of course. Thuggy was an obscenity that worshipped Kali with human sacrifices. There you go. I, I made sure to get in the snake surprise in there because that was, you know, the thing in eating the beetles and, of course, the dessert, which was chilled monkey brain. Or I think it was, was a monkey brain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, this was as one of the the actors, both actors, uh, Rajan Seth and um, Emrish Pura. And if I'm messing up those names, well, I'm from Missouri and I'm white. Sorry. I'm uncultured, um, but, you know, they were talking about how they agreed to those scenes because it was so comical. It was so over the top that it was supposed to be they were serving food that Westerners thought that people from India ate. It was not a good joke. It didn't go over well. But as a kid, we never saw any of that. We just thought it was cool that they were eating snakes and bugs. Yeah, I mean, this is just is plugged right into like, you know, a kids playing in the sandbox and pretending to eat gross things. You know, that's that's what this is. And it's and, you know, when they 
talk about the fan the the controversy of it my answer is always sort of like it's fantasy none of this movie at least that's what my kid brain thought when i was watching it i was like none of this is real this is like in a in a adventure time you know in the 30s it's not even current you know like it didn't feel like it was supposed to be representative of India. You know what I mean? It felt like it was supposed to just be part of this crazy ass movie. <laughs> yeah. And I know the actor who played Molly Ra, Molly Ram, Molly Ra. I don't, don't remember exactly how to pronounce it, but Amrish Puri, he had to, to put up with this for years because he defended it. He's just like, I wasn't in the scene, but I was in the movie and everything. He's like, this film was clearly comedy. It was so over the top. It was so fantastical. It was so stupid that he's like, that's why we agreed to do this stuff, because we just didn't think it was that bad. We just thought it was stupid. And uh, it almost was like we were laughing at the Western. Do you really think we eat this shit? Uh, and then, you know, it was funny because there's been back and forth. A lot of people from India, especially politicians or. Uh, you know, talking heads were were bashing it. And I understand that. I really do. Uh, I understand both sides here. But later on, as this goes, it seemed like it actually did something good, as in the Western culture were then now introduced to discovering what is India really like. And there are a lot of people saying like this, this film specifically introduced a lot of people from the Western world to Indian culture because then people started teaching what actually Indian culture was like instead of just this, you know, like comic and these over the top characters that aren't real. So I kind of get both sides on this. Yeah, I mean, I told like I am obviously making very much an argument for the fact that it's spoofy. It's, you know, funny. It's over the top. It's fantasy. I see the side of people being upset as well. I definitely you know, as as a person growing up in the Western world, I can't really comment on how their perspective of it is. So, like, you know, I see it, but like to defend the movie, I really do think, yeah, it's fantasy. Yeah, it's over the top. Yeah, it's two guys from California that had probably only been to India maybe once for fun. I'm assuming that's why they're so interested in it. I don't think anything was meant bad by it. And I find it really interesting to hear like an Indian perspective when I hear, you know, older um, this actor, two of the actors uh, talk about it, how they're just like, we just thought this was so stupid. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah. And like, you know, as a kid audience, that is sort of what comes across. So, yeah, it's interesting to hear that that is, you know, some of the actors, you know, who lived it, who were there, their perspective of it. Yeah, moving on. Uh, I mean, Kate Capshaw, I got to give her credit. When we get to the bug scene, which is I, the dinner scene was big for us as kids. We usually would watch the beginning scene. We would fast forward to the dinner scene. Then we'd fast forward to the bug scene. And those are real bugs. None of this is fake. I mean, she had to take a sedative. They had to give her a sedative. And I don't blame you. I, I don't want like 2000 something bugs crawling around me. It's awesome. This is all real. They had bug wranglers professional trainers which is weird in 19 probably 83 when this was shot i would assume they wouldn't give a shit about bugs no 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 this was a big deal this took a lot of bug wranglers to come up and mix all these bugs so there wouldn't be some giant war and they had to do a, i'm sure there were some bugs killed because i mean come on you're you're walking around 2000 some bugs how do you miss all of them uh but i, I was impressed that they actually went to this length to make sure these bugs were protected and trained and all this shit. I think that's crazy. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, like you said, maybe maybe the 80s is kind of the earliest example of like actually taking care of, I mean, not even just bugs, just animals in general in movies uh, more. Yeah, because a couple of weeks ago, you know, Chris was telling us about Milo and Otis. And how fucked up that movie was for little animals. Right, right. So, like, yeah, by this time, big Hollywood production, yeah, you're going to need, like, bug wranglers and stuff like that for this scene. Uh, yeah, let me tell you, if I was in their shoes and I had to do that, first of all, I wouldn't do it. Second of all, if I had to do it, I would have to be on heavy sedatives. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, man, she was a trooper. She did it. And I'm not sitting there saying, like, oh, you had to do it on sedatives. Oh, tis, 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 you know, other actors wouldn't. 
I don't care, man. That's uh, bugs crawling on me is one of those things I can deal with, but I don't like it. And if someone gave me the option for sedatives, I'd take it. Yeah, I don't like that shit. I don't like that shit one bit. I would not be happy in that situation. <laughs> I probably wouldn't do it. <laughs> she was probably like got in a corner and like pumped herself up. And they're like, you know, we can just give you sedatives. And she goes, and I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> It's like, wow, I didn't know that was an option. Yeah, we got this drug girl. You know, we got this drug guy over here. <laughs> He's for Harrison Ford. He gets he gets migraines. <laughs> and we got 2000 of these things on the floor. You're going to need it. <laughs> I know. And some of them are big, uh, but we loved it as a kid, especially, you know, all the the traps and everything. We skipped right over the like little sexual into windows. And she's like talking about him studying stuff. We like we didn't care. Give us bugs. Yeah, the gross stuff. <laughs> and then we get to the chanting, Kali Ma, and the ceremony of the ripping out the heart. But he's not actually ripping out the heart. I don't know if you know that, Baron. Spoilers. <laughs> he just has the heart. I know. I love it. We loved it so much as a kid. And it creeped out my mom because we used to chant. We used to do the two chants that creeped out my mom the most. We, we did the, the Chucky you know latin and everything like that i can't remember it as well now but we used to chant that my mom hated it and we used to chant this and my mom hated it that's hilarious (laughs) and we used to pretend doing the sacrifice we'd always kill one of us i'm gonna be honest i was always the one being molly raw you know (laughs) i was killing my brothers but they were little they deserved it yeah exactly you had the power (laughs) <laughs> yeah, if you wanted to survive, you should have been born first. Then the rules, I don't make them. It's a hierarchy. You can't change that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we used to chant this, and I got a little bit of it because I love this actor. Bali Mangdi Kali Ma. Mukti Degi Kali Ma. Kali Ma. Kali Ma. All right, so here's the best one we ever did when we'd be like, Shaktika Kolima. I took ketchup and put it on my knuckles and wiped it all over my brother's chest, and my mom got so pissed. But it was the greatest thing we ever did. Yeah, but you probably loved every second of it. (laughs) Yeah, my brother's like, it's sticky. And I'm like, it's your, I'm ripping out your heart. You got to act here. I was also playing like older brother director. (laughs) Come on, we got to do this scene right. I got the gore for us. (laughs) Yeah, and then I remember one time Anthony was taking like, so when you have the, you know, um, the wrapping paper and you have the rolls underneath, if you just do it right and you like twist it in circle formations, you can get it kind of like a whip because it all detaches, but still stays together. Anthony was whipping at, you know, me. <laughs> uh, this is a whole scene. We used to do these whole movie scenes with my parents and my mom, my dad would laugh and my mom would get very upset. She's like, I can't believe you're letting them do this. My dad would be like, they're kids. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, and literally the reason why PG-13 <laughs> was invented because of kids like you doing shit like that in the yeah. kitchen with the ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I also was the kid who was taking the butter knife and trying to do the uh, the knife trick the bishop did in uh, Aliens. So, yeah, I'm the reason <laughs> all these. Well, that was rated R, but you know what I mean? Yeah, all these movies that were marketed to kids, <laughs> aliens included. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, why we did all that shit and why the parents got all mad. I I know that like when this scene happened the first time I saw this movie. I mean, this is sort of where I both like I fell in love with this movie with this scene, but also then the rest of the movie never reaches the heights of this scene. <laughs> That's true. Oh, I don't know. The getaway on the mine cart, that's pretty fucking awesome. I mean, I think I love that more today, but as a kid. I mean, as a kid that loved the gross shit, like you're talking about the bugs and the monkey brains and stuff like that, like 
you, the it ends sort of with the heart. Yeah, the adventure stuff is fun with the cart and the, the basically the universal ride that it is. Um, but like for uh, for me as the first time watcher, it never reached this heights. Yeah, as an adult, I like it all though. <laughs> now speaking of the universal ride, they never did this as a universal ride, correct? No, I think they did a stage show only. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because they they had the plane and everything leaving the water. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's sad. I mean, because this is a ride. This is a ride that every kid would pay. I would have begged my parents if this was in Universal Studios. Anytime I see in like a Spielberg movie or a Universal movie or just sort of like a big or Hollywood Amblin, movie that, Universal, Paramount, whatever that crosses into there. I always wish there were rides for all of these type of, you know, moments of like, why didn't River Wild get a ride? You know, why didn't, why didn't this have a ride? You know, like. River Wild would have been a good ride, but for adults, because I don't think kids would have been attracted to it. But like, could you imagine 1985? No, wait, when did that movie come out? River Wild? 94. Yeah, 94. Okay, let's let's uh, pretend 1996, 30 year old and 40 year old Steve went to Universal. We'd be on that in a second. And I dragged my kid to it. <laughs> I wouldn't bat an eye. <laughs> I'd be on that thing. I'd go on it twice. <laughs> Last time I was at Universal, I was 18 years old. I rode the mummy ride five times. So <laughs> I know. I hope my kid is ready. I mean, I already put him in five Halloween costumes, which we only bought one, folks. So if you go on my Facebook and you see him, he's in five costumes. We only bought one. I'm not that crazy, but we were getting pictures in all five. Hell yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have kids to put them in Halloween costumes. The rest of the year, I'm a deadbeat dad. <laughs> until theme park season happens when he's a little older <laughs> yeah and then i'm like the greatest dad in the world who's like dragging his passed out kid he's like I'm too tired nope 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 we got three more rides <laughs> yeah we still we still have to do the king kong ride <laughs> and if matt's there i'm like uncle we can't disappoint uncle matt <laughs> Hey, Kidney, you're, you're pop, if I'm there, you're Papa Steve, and you're taking care of your two kids that day, your 35-year-old <laughs> and your 5-year-old. <laughs> oh, no. Well, we're getting a lot of turkey legs, kids. <laughs> we need that salt and fat to keep up with all the energy we're burning. And I'm just over there like, turkey legs, turkey legs. <laughs> <laughs> Universal, like, I know a lot of people are like, I can't wait to take my kids to Disney, and I will. But I'm more of a universal theme park kid. Oh, yeah. I, I, that trip I was talking about when I was 18 and I went to Universal, I think I spent five days at Universal. I spent one at Disney. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a universal guy through and through. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it was because I grew up next to Six Flags. Like, like there was something different. I wanted the alternative to Disney. I don't know if that's something in my brain. Or maybe it's because I like Mac and me over E.T. Maybe that's the true like uh, <laughs> thing that we should investigate one day. But either way. Uh, yeah. You know what? The rest of the film after the, the you know, the universal ride that is the mine shaft and everything like that. It's fun. You know, I like the little gun trick where he doesn't have the gun and they're playing. You know, they're making fun of the first one. Uh, and then he's he's on the the bridge with the alligators and everything ever since. But honestly, the movie ends in my like kid brain right when the mind right ends. I'm like, OK, I'm done. I can just leave. Yeah, like I said, when I was a kid, it ended with the Kalima scene. So I totally I understand that. Uh, but yeah, as an adult, though, like I like I said, I like the, the ride scene. And then I, I like the crocodile scene. I like the bridge over the crocodile. I think it's a really good kind of intense finale yeah i like it as an adult but i don't give a shit as a kid because i'm like all right i'm ready to go outside and play <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so there's two different things because it's fun to watch now the the problem with this is i watched this on three different formats in the last like couple months because i knew we were going to do this for 200 i watched the original one and i quit i just couldn't get through it it's so bad i put it up on my shelf and I'm never going to watch it again. It's bad, folks. Uh, and then I watched, then I went straight way too far into the HD. And you can see all the lines. You can see all the tricks. 
And I'm like, oh, we need a middle ground. And then I went to this re-release and it is a great middle ground. It really is. I would very much recommend if you watch this film and you're nostalgic, watch the night, the mid 90s re-release of these because they lightened up the darkness, but you still can't see all the puppet strings, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, that's the this is kind of one of those movies that is tailor made still for sort of like a not premium format, you know, like like I agree with you 100 percent. That first VHS is useless. But yeah, later VHS. I also I I watched this on the sort of first run of the DVD and that looks fine, too. Like that doesn't give away any of the secrets either. That still has a little roughness to it. Yeah, you have to find that like spot where it like and I have ambulance going in the background because, you know, Indy almost fall off a bridge and everything. So they're coming to save him. That's right. I love the middle ground of this. I think they did a great job. I'm sure the early DVDs. What I'm saying is don't watch the Blu-rays. Yeah, I can imagine so many of these. Yeah, so many of these magic is kind of lost in HD. It's actually a downgrade in special effects from the first one. If you watch it in these like Blu-ray HDs, it really is. And this won the Academy Award over Ghostbusters, which I I don't care how much I like this film. Ghostbusters, in my mind, won. I'm just saying Ghostbusters changed the game. And I think you said that earlier in the podcast. Yeah, Ghostbusters came along and was like, you know, changed the way we did special effects. This one came along and just did a Spielberg movie, which is incredible. Do not get me wrong, but... Ghostbusters, come on. <laughs> yeah. I think if we redid that today, Ghostbusters would win. It just like was I had never seen anything like that. I had seen Indiana Jones. I just saw it like three. OK, when I was a kid, I don't know how many years before, because I'll be honest, I don't think I watched these movies in a row. I'm almost certain that this was my first. Yeah, this was my first as well. I think I went two, three, one. Honestly, I think I did, too. Uh, And it took me a long time to appreciate how good one is, because it used to be like this was my favorite. Three was my second favorite. And then one, because I thought one was boring. And then when I got older, I'm like, I'm still sticking with Temple of Doom as my favorite. And I'll be honest, it's because the set decoration is insane. This reached a new level. This is like pinnacle 80s set decoration. That whole you know, fire and brimstone and everything like that. And then the adventure of him escaping the strong man and the mind, the mine shaft ride and everything. Listen, I know a lot of people are going to be like the first one's iconic. You can't compare it. And I'm like, yeah, but this, this set decorations better. I'm sorry. It is in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the production design here is definitely more, more memorable than the first, because the first is so many like landscapes and, actual existing stuff this is a lot of sets this is a lot of production design this is a lot of you know it probably took a lot to put that kind of mine shaft ride together so like yeah the production design's out of control and this this is big money hollywood blockbuster here yeah so before we go on the museum matt this is a big 50 50 coin flip do you recommend temple of doom Oh, hugely recommend it. I <laughs> love this movie. I I am a uh, one two person. Like I, I love the first one a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and then immediately after would put this one. You know, my hot take is that I like four more than three, but they're still not even close to the first two. <laughs> I don't know if I told everyone, but this is Matt's last episode after that shit. What are you talking about? <laughs> And, and uh, here's and actually talk, I can talk about this here because real quick, because I, it is tied to what we've been talking about this whole episode. One of the, the, the reason that I would take four over three is simply because four we do the 40s again. It doesn't really feel kind of like a 40s movie. It just kind of feels like a late 80s movie. It doesn't have like that vibe. And the reason I like four a little bit more is that it captures sort of that 50 sci fi B movie vibe that you know the other movies are capturing their time period so accurately so that's why i do it but like like i said one two is are the two you need and then i like four and then three is the one i watch the least whenever we get to number three we'll talk about that i have problems with three as an adult 
but I can't stand for uh, because part of me thinks that they just didn't take it serious. And I, you don't have to take these films serious, but what I mean is like they almost haphazardly put it together. I don't know. Uh, we'll talk about that whenever we get to them. No matter what happens in this podcast, even if we retire and we never do a podcast again, we're coming back for three and four. We're going to find <laughs> some way. It's going to be 19 or 19. That doesn't make no sense. Um, it's going to be 2047. I'm be like, I'm about to die. We're doing number four. And you'll be like, that's my favorite one other than one or two. And I'm like, yeah, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you're like a grizzled old smoker and I'm still a child in the uh, <laughs> in the future. <laughs> I, I could be could be accurate. I don't know. <laughs> but I hope in the future I have some uh, Robocop legs and stuff like that. I'm still walking really well, but I got a grizzled voice. They still haven't fixed the voice boxes. <laughs> But they can fix everything. Yeah. But you found the found in youth and you're like, I'm still 30 years old. I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you share that with me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go on to the museum. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. This is the part of the show where we go out in the film jungle like Indy to find something great in Indiana Jones. So, uh, Matt, I'll let you go first. What are you putting in the museum? Well, you let me go first. So I'm going to take Halima because, duh, it's the best scene in the movie. <laughs> it's uh, it's awesome. There's a bloody heart in it and it's crazy and the set's nuts and the guy's outfit is nuts and it's awesome. Uh, but there's so much other good stuff in this movie that like, you know, this is just picking, I guess, the cherry on top. There's so much good stuff. But I love I love this scene. How, this is iconic. This is, you think, Temple of Doom? You think this part. So that's my museum entry. Uh, mine is going to be the white savior riding the mine shaft ride. Oh, I ruined it. <laughs> but we should talk about the white savior shit, right? Uh, I mean, the mine shaft ride no. I already talked about. <laughs> it's great. No, we don't have to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I just think it's ridiculous. That's I think it's just putting too much of somebody somebody's negative thoughts on it. I don't uh, maybe, think that, yeah. that I don't think that's the case at all in this movie. I think it's just it's Indiana Jones. It's a superhero movie. It's silly. <laughs> I wonder. Part of me is just like, okay, so George Lucas is from California. I believe he's from California, but he definitely went to school in California. And people tend to write the heroes, the protagonists in their films to reflect themselves. So you start with the beginning one, you move on to the second one. Of course, it's going to be a white hero and they're just looking for something new. I, I just really think this is overthought. Yes. And I really exactly. think it's just like, Oh, where are we going to take Indiana Jones? He's got to be the hero. Now, of course this would be written different in 2021 because we've got to deal with the Twitter mob, but they didn't mean any harm by this. And I think there's way too much overthinking and way too much overreaction. I just think it's like, where are we going to put Indiana Jones to be the hero again? I don't know. I don't want to do Nazis. Sweet. Let's go to India. That's it. I think that's all this was. Exactly. Exactly. The whole white savior argument, I think is null and void because that's way, way overthinking. Indiana Jones part two. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I get the sexist stuff with Willie. Of course I do. It's, it's a bunch of white guys writing a woman. I get it. I get the stereotypical sidekick, you know, because it's a bunch of white guys writing a Chinese sidekick. But the white savior, I think, even though we are both white and I'm white, I'm going to I'm going to take the brunt of this. I, I think it's way overdone. I just, it's just a comic book character in a world. I mean, whatever. I mean, technically, you could say that, you know, Short Round was also the protagonist in this. He was just the sidekick protagonist. Yeah, but think about how much screen time he gets and everything like that. You know, like he's he's in this just as much. So and he saved those kids, too. So there there's another null and void to that argument. <laughs> yeah. And before we end this, the child labor, I would like to say. 
That's a terrible idea. These kids aren't strong. Why are you having them doing mining? Yeah, that wasn't thought out too well. <laughs> <laughs> like these, how they, they can barely swing a pickaxe. You're, this will be the slowest mind mine ever. <laughs> that is so true. One hundred percent accurate. That that's just Steve, the the older male efficiency. You know, I, I'm thinking about efficiency here as an older male here, or just an older person. Doesn't matter. I'm male. That's terrible efficiency, folks. Come on, if you're gonna do anything, steal the dads. They're the ones who are old up and grown and ready to go. And I guarantee, if you put a gun to their kid's head, they're gonna mine the shit out of that. It's true. That's I mean, that's way better logic, but <laughs> I guess they maybe they just get off on the child labor thing. I don't know. Maybe it's a power thing. I honestly think at their point, you know, like George Lucas and everything at the point and everything. And of course, the writers of Howard the Duck, one of the greatest films ever made. I just think they're like, hey, this is going to piss some people off. Yeah, these these are the writers of Howard the Duck, like you said. They're probably just choosing what's weird, what's funny, what's crazy, what's quirky. You know, that's that's all that's going on here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. So that'll end it this week. Matt, number 200. Whatever, whatever happens in the future and everything, I am really proud of what we've done. Same. Um, and you've done so much, uh, you know, great work on promoting it, getting it out there and getting the listens and everything like that and putting them all together uh every week so good on you uh you made this uh, a real thing and i'm just the monkey that shows up and says weird shit sometimes <laughs> you know you like dance films but you're not the greatest dancer but you're the best sidekick monkey i've ever had perfect perfect that's all i've ever strived for <laughs> <laughs> And I hope one day you write your second film, you get to direct it. I hope you do many more. I'm just saying, as of right now, I hope you write your second film. We all get to watch it and we have a party. It's it's happening. Yeah, you know, it, it's slow. It's a slow thing with the, the wheels are in motion and it's coming. All right. But you got to write me in a very small part where I'm like a retail salesman. You say that. Just wait. <laughs> oh, I'd show up 100%. I'd be the most prepared person on set. Like, you, know, you know you only have like four lines. I'll be like, but those four lines are going to be dynamite. <laughs> yeah, don't you worry. Don't you worry about a thing. <laughs> well, don't worry. I've been in stage productions in high school and college. And both of them, I barely had any lines. So I'm ready. I'm ready. You're prepared. You are prepared. Yeah, this has been a this has been a fun uh, two hundred uh, movie long journey, and uh, my brain may be potatoes, but um, <laughs> it has been fun going through so many lumps of plastic. Uh, <laughs> the analog way, it's been it has been absolutely crazy. I cannot believe it's been four years. <laughs> I can't believe we've been friends that long either. Yeah, well, I mean, we were friends for the first two years and we've hated each other for the last two, but, you know. <laughs> There's definitely an asterisk next to that. Because <laughs> yeah. once I we find do. out that you like number four over number three and two and one, I'm just going to rewrite history. Matt is the only man on history that thinks Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull is the best Indiana Jones. Uh, that is 100% not accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm... I'm going to burn this thing down to the ground now. <laughs> That's funny because my notes also say that you like Mad Max Thunderdome the most. Oh, yuck. <laughs> I, I can very much say that I would like to go the rest of my life without having to watch that again. <laughs> well, that'll do it this week. So remember to be kind. And rewind. <laughs>